Doug Smith on the Extension Agent in Houston County for Ag and Natural Resources. Uh, welcome tonight to the Ag in the Evening series. We'll wait just a few more seconds and let some other people get logged on. But in the meantime, uh, before we actually get started, if everyone will mute their mic. And if you have questions, if you scroll down to the bottom, you'll see a, a little uh, icon that says chat. Feel free to pop your questions in, those, in that chat box and we will get to them. But I guess, uh, Dr. Olson, if you're ready, we'll go ahead and get things kicked off. Again, welcome to the Ag in the Evening program. I'm Joe Smith. Tonight's session is on, as you can see there on your screen, um, thinning of warm grass perennials, um, or as we called it earlier, Bermuda grass decline. We're all grass farmers in some way, and so we want to make sure that um, our forages are, are in good health and um, do well for us. So Dr. Olson is going to talk about some issues that we see on that end. Again, don't forget to use the chat box if you have questions. And with that, I will turn it over to you, Dr. Olson. All right, thanks, Joe. So like she said, welcome to the Ag in the Evening program for this evening. Uh, my name is Vanessa Coyer Olson. I'm the Forage Extension Specialist with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension, located at the Overton Research and Extension Center. So tonight, my presentation is entitled Thinning of Warm Season Perennial Grass Stands. It could also be titled Bermuda Grass Decline. It could be titled, Why Do I Have Dead Spots in My Pasture in My Hay Meadow? There's a lot of kind of different names, synonymous um, verbiage that we use to describe some issues that we may have in our warm season perennial sides, whether it's, whether it's Bermuda grass or Bahia grass. And this is not limited to Bermuda grass. Any of our warm season perennial forages are, are sub, can be subject to decline or reduction in production because of various issues. And we're gonna talk about all the possible reasons we might have some issues or see shifts in our stands of those warm season perennial forages. Um, so like Joe said, if you have any questions, drop those in the chat. Myself and Joe will try to keep our eyes open for those and address those as we can. Um, we may have to wait till the end, kind of depending on a number of questions and whatnot. I do want to let you know that this is being recorded. We are posting these on a YouTube page. Um, we will send that information out um, after probably in the next couple of days after the meeting, so you can go back and watch the presentation or any of our other Ag in the Evening presentations that we've had since March. So we've been doing this for a while. So we've collected quite a few. If you haven't participated in any before, welcome um, to, this, to this program that we're hosting and hopefully we will continue to do so um, for, for as long as we unfortunately have to do most of our programs by virtual. So nonetheless, we're gonna get started. We're gonna talk about the thinning of warm season sides. So the next couple of pictures are actually from uh, 2020. If this, you know, if 2020 couldn't get stranger, um, I would say that for the entire month of June, majority of the phone calls or emails that I fielded were in regards to a thinning or lack of a reduction in production on Bermuda grass or a loss of a stand completely. Um, I had a producer in Henderson in Russ County, um, Texas, so near the Overton Center that lost complete fields of Bahia grass. Um, so I've had multiple cases. They've been in Central Texas. They've been in East Texas. It could just be a few dead spots. It could be like you see in this in this image where you see some open or what appears to be kind of a, a thinning of a stand and there's actually an encroachment of some other grass species such as Dallas grass and crabgrass. I will say that this year I've answered more questions on controlling crabgrass than I have in the past. Um, and of course, grassy weeds within a grass pasture or hay meadow can be very challenging um, and can become very competitive against our warm season perennial sods. And we'll talk about that when we talk about weed pressure and how that influences the production or persistence of some of our forages. Um, so there's already been a question, what is the weed in those clumps? Um, most of those were crabgrass. And I will talk about, uh, I'll talk about weed control a little bit and I will address some recommendations on controlling crabgrass. Um, so if you just wanna stay on, you'll, you'll learn more. 
So this happened to be in Kaufman County. Um, here's another image. You can see very, very little Bermuda grass or what forage is there appears to be dead. You see some broadleaf vegetation, some broadleaf weeds. Um, some of those may be broomweed or buttercup. It's, it's really hard to tell this far out. I'd have to zoom a little bit closer to some of those plants to really identify. And that, that wasn't the issue that was being addressed. The question was why does my Bermuda grass appear to be dying or has died? What has happened? And most people tend to think that they have done everything that is, is important for Bermuda grass or Bahia grass production. And in some cases, they, they did to a point. Um, and so the point of tonight is to talk about what Bermuda grass or warm season perennial decline is. Um, it's basically a broad term. It's typically a problem or an issue that is linked to several causes. Um, so it's rarely a single cause. Um, sometimes it may be, but a lot of times it's an accumulation of mismanagement or poor decisions or lack of management that has led to a thinning of a stand or weed encroachment or dead spots potentially. Now I have had producers that have followed best management practices to the best of their ability and still had some of these those issues this year. I think this year was very unique. Every year is very unique whenever it comes to weather patterns. We think we know what normal is, but I, I don't know that our weather patterns in Texas are what they were in the past. Um, I know they've changed quite a bit just in the 12 years I've been in Texas. And our May for most of Texas, Central and East Texas, was cooler than what I have experienced in my short 12 years in regards to temperatures. We had a lot of moisture this spring, which we're very thankful for. Um, we move into potentially very dry conditions in the summer for Texas, especially in June, July, and August. I mean, now we're sitting here in most of the state really seeking and desiring rainfall, but we had quite a bit in the spring, which is great, really promotes those winter forages that we potentially overseeded into those perennial sods, and it creates, builds up some soil moisture, hopefully for our warm season perennials as their season starts. Um, but this May was very different, and I think our weather in May, all of our moisture, as well as those cooler temperatures really impacted how our Bermuda grass or Bahia grass started the actual season after it had broken dormancy, it was delayed to actually start growing because it had already broken dormancy. And then we, even in May, we had some nights that got down into 50s or potentially even lower. I think there was a night in May where some places got down into the 30s. I remember having to decide whether or not to carry all my plants back into the garage or back into the house that I have in pots. So a lot of times our issues are a culmination of several factors. Um, sometimes there becomes a straw that quote unquote breaks the camel's back. And that's a very old, very popular saying, but it can be very true. Excuse me, when we have some, some of these issues that start to build up um, in, our, in our pastures and hay meadows. And some of these poor management issues could have been several years ago. And it could be later, a couple of years down the road that we start to see the cumulative effects of some of those, those bad decisions. So what are the usual suspects or the typical reasons, some of the reasons that might cause some of these issues or collective reasons that could cause some of these issues? Unmanaged cool season annual forages, such as ryegrass or small grains or legumes, um, not managing those properly, and we'll talk about that to some degree, can have an impact on our warm season perennials on their production and their ability to recover or to break dormancy in that spring period uncontrolled weed problems. Um, and we'll talk about those. If we do not control weeds, um, they can become a problem. They can be very reproductive, produce a lot of seed. They oftentimes can be more competitive if other, other situations are lacking for that desired forage. So take, for example, we have poor soil fertility. Weeds are much more tolerant of lower soil fertility than our desired forages are. So poor fertility, soil fertility, low soil pH, <clears throat> those can impact not only the production, the amount of forage we're able to produce or the value, the nutritive value of that forage, but it's also going to impact the persistence. So how long that perennial species will stay in that pasture, that hay meadow and continue to be productive. Prolonged and extreme drought, <clears throat> and oftentimes drought becomes the nail in the coffin because of other issues. 
overstocking or overgrazing, grazing that warm season perennial down to the soil repeatedly um, can be very damaging to that root structure and create a situation where things like drought um, can basically take out a stand or really weaken a stand. Disease, um, there are funguses, um, diseases that can become problematic in Bermuda grass and Bahia grass. They're not very common. Um, they are often similar to the common cold for us as humans. Something that's fairly minor that doesn't necessarily require a trip to the doctor, we can get over very quickly with a few over-the-counter medications. However, if it goes untreated, then, um, or if there's other stressors, if we have other stressors in our life, and then we get the common cold, it could potentially lead to pneumonia or could end up becoming the flu. Um, so very much the same way, a disease in and of by itself may not necessarily be that damaging, but if that's added on top of other stressors, it can be very damaging to our perennial forages. Herbicide injury, even though all, hopefully all of the herbicides you are using in your pastures and your hay meadows are labeled for that scenario, um, if those forages are stressed, if that Bermuda grass is stressed from drought or disease or poor soil fertility, and the right combination of the right combination of situation or factors can lead to a herbicide that is used appropriately, um, that is labeled for that scenario and used at the appropriate rate, could still be potential could potentially cause damage because of other stress events that have just lined up and um, really weakened the, that plant structure and soil compaction not necessarily as common in East Texas and our sandy soils, but it is something that I want to talk about. Um, some of you may not necessarily be strictly in East Texas. Some of you may have some heavier clay soils, some blackland clay soils, depending on where you or your property are located in the state, and that could potentially be part of an issue um, impeding the nutrient recovery for your warm season perennial grasses. All right, so we're gonna go through each one of these, talk about them in a little detail some recommendations um, in regards to how to manage those before they become, out, become, before they come out of, become unmanageable or they get out of control. That's what I was looking for. So our cool season annual forages, annual ryegrass um, is probably used in the most acreage is planted in annual ryegrass in Texas compared to some of our other cool season forages. Majority of our annual ryegrass is planted east of I-35 because of higher average annual rainfall. So it takes moisture to grow ryegrass. And this year we had, we had a wet spring. We had a lot of moisture. So we were able to produce a lot of ryegrass. Now, unfortunately, majority of our ryegrass production is in the spring. Sure, we call it a winter forage. We have winter pasture programs where we talk about ryegrass, but a majority of the, of the ryegrass that is produced from the time you plant it, until the spring is going to actually be in the spring. And ryegrass can stick around if temperatures and moisture are supportive and available, can stick around on into June. Bermuda grass is going to break dormancy typically mid to late April, May, depending on our night temperatures. When our night temperatures stay in 60 degree Fahrenheit and consistently um, at that temperature, that is when Bermuda grass will break dormancy and eventually start actively growing. So it has to be consistent to start actively growing. Unfortunately, we can still have annual rye grass growing at that time. And if you have more, if your rye grass is knee high or is very tall and has been very productive and you haven't been able to graze it down or you haven't had an opportunity to harvest it because you've had so much moisture, you can't get into your fields, that ryegrass can actually outcompete that Bermuda grass. And Dr. Gerald Evers, who is a retired forage physiologist from Overton, from Texas A&M AgriLife Research, actually did um, an evaluation of the impact of our cool season forages and the planting methods, the disking um, and whatnot, and planting ryegrass or a clover or a combination and how that overseeding those into a Bermuda grass sod, how that impacted Bermuda grass production the next year. And it definitely had an impact. It reduced the, the yield of that Bermuda grass, even if it was removed at an appropriate time. So ryegrass, any of our cool season forages are highly valuable because they provide a high quality forage during a time of which we are typically feeding hay that may be inadequate in nutrients for our livestock. So there are a lot of benefits, higher quality, 
forage provided during the winter as opposed to hay that may be expensive or maybe in lower quality. Um, Dr. Evers also found in his study that where he had overseeded the ryegrass or the legume or combination thereof, those plots didn't have nearly or any weed, weed species, whereas where he did not overseed, he had weeds. So there, they also help outcompete any cool season weeds that might pop up during that season as well. So there's a lot of benefits to using these cool season forages. We just have to understand how they can impact our warm season perennial sod. So that is one reason I never recommend overseeding a hay meadow unless you truly can manage it. You can either harvest that forage for hay and get it removed off of that hay meadow at an appropriate time, or maybe it's a pasture slash hay meadow, but you can still have it grazed down or harvested to open up that canopy to allow that Bermuda grass to break dormancy and to grow and out ultimately try to outcompete that rye grass or that other cool season annual forage. Rye grass and many of our legumes um, are much more spring forage producers compared to our small grain, such as rye, oats, or wheat. Um, also, one of the recommendations is only plant what you can use. So look at your overall production system. Do you need that higher quality forage during that time? Um, only plant what you can use. Um, and you know, keep in mind some years, ryegrass is gonna be more productive than others. Um, so there's a lot of decisions that go into that, but just make sure that you can manage that forage. And I've definitely seen this year in many situations, the issues with the the resulting thinning of a stand of Bermuda grass or loss of a Bahia grass stand was solely due to the inability to remove any winter forages, any winter weeds from that, from that location. Uh, whether it was volunteer ryegrass, um, there are a multitude of herbicides or we have choices for herbicides to control volunteer ryegrass and hay meadows. That can be a problem in, um, in East Texas. And so there are solutions, there are tools that we can use to control these cool season forages to prevent the, the major impact on those warm season perennial sods. Um, and I can address any of those um, later if someone has a specific question about some of those options. Um, weed control, uh, weed encroachment. I will say oftentimes we are going to see more weed encroachment in our pastures or hay meadows when we have neglected our pastures in other areas, whether we have overgrazed those pastures, maybe we have not fertilized or limed appropriately to maintain or to support or to promote that desired forage. So one of the best ways to manage weeds is to promote that desired forage with by maintaining soil fertility, maintaining an appropriate soil pH for that forage species, as well as not overgrazing that forage. Um, reducing the ability of that forage to compete against weed species allows those weeds to become more competitive. When there's open space, there's bare ground, it's an opportunity for weeds, for seeds to germinate, take advantage of no competition and ultimately become more competitive. An excellent example, and I should have included a picture, is broom sedge. Uh, if you drive through east, and Central Texas in, let's see, probably January, February, March time period, you'll see what appears to be a lot of tall dead grass. It's taller typically than Bermuda grass or Bahia grass than it appears to be in bunches. And a lot of people, I got a lot of questions this year about what that was, and it's broom sedge. Broom, broom sedge bluestem is not very competitive. So if you have been promoting that desired forage, be it Bermuda grass or Bahia grass, you're gonna see very little broom sedge because it's not very competitive. But once you have weakened that warm season perennial stand by low soil fertility, by overgrazing, that's when things like broom sedge can become competitive or almost take over and can become the dominant species within that pasture or hay meadow. Um, and unfortunately with species like that, a lot of times we're limited on the herbicides that will control broom sedge. And our only option is going to be Roundup along with improving our management of that warm season perennial stand, whether it's Bermuda grass or Bahia grass. I can speak, I know a producer that has just not fertilized his field. It was Bermuda grass that's slowly been encroached by Bahia grass, and now it's been encroached with broom sedge. Um, he can't remember the last time he fertilized or limed it, and so it's slowly being taken over by broom sedge. 
And I will tell you, the longer he lets that go, it's going to require a lot more money to ultimately replant entirely, whether it's with Bermuda grass or Bahia grass. Um, because slowly the weeds, not only broom sedge, but other broadleaf weeds have taken over, have started to become the dominant species in those, in those areas. So in regards to weed control, herbicides are going to be one of the better options to provide residual control, effective control of various species. Now I mentioned crabgrass earlier. Crabgrass has been a very popular question this year. It is a grassy weed. It is a warm season annual. First recommendation is if it is in a pasture, I would recommend your cattle to graze it. Allow them to graze it. Being a warm season annual, crabgrass is actually higher in nutritive value than Bermuda grass or Bahia grass. Um, crabgrass does prefer well-drained locations, but it likes moisture. So I think we've seen more crabgrass this year because of the wet spring, the cooler temperatures um, during that May that maybe slowed or delayed Bermuda grass from really taking off and crabgrass was able to take off and become productive and take advantage of that moisture and that Bermuda grass that wasn't very competitive at that time of year. So a couple of options on crabgrass. Prow H2O, which is a pre-emergent, is labeled for Bermuda grass and Bahia grass that is dormant. So that would typically be a January, February time period for an application can be effective at controlling crabgrass. Now it's not gonna be 100% because crab, all of those crabgrass seeds are not gonna germinate at that time of year. So some other options would be Roundup or glyphosate. Um, we can spray glyphosate and cause very little to minimal damage to our Bermuda grass. Um, now Bahia grass, we may take out some of our Bahia grass if it is a Bahia grass field. But Roundup is an excellent option to control um, a lot of weeds and it's very effective on some of our grassy weeds where we have very little other options. Another option is Pastora, which is labeled for Bermuda grass, pastures and hay meadows. It has activity on large crab grass. It will also control Bahia grass. So it is not labeled, it's not recommended for an area where you're growing Bahia grass on purpose or you have that as, as one of your forage options. So weed control is going to be important to to minimize that competition, to really promote that desired, that desired forage production. Now herbicide injury, herbicides that we routinely use um, do not necessarily cause damage to Bermuda grass or Bahia grass, but going back to any time we talk about herbicides, anytime we talk about any type of pesticide, the label is the law, and it is important to read that label to make sure you are not potentially causing damage to that Bermuda grass or Bahia grass. Um, because there can be some scenarios where we can cause damage because of timing of that application or other stressors that that Bermuda grass or Bahia grass is already subject to, be it low soil fertility, overgrazing, drought. That is why we never recommend the use of herbicides during drought. Um, if our, in regards to drought conditions, all of our plants, whether it's a desirable Bermuda grass or undesirable goat weeds, are basically going to conserve any moisture that they have within their plant structure and they're not going to actively take in a herbicide to be effective at controlling those goat weeds and you're increasing the risk of potentially causing damage to your Bermuda grass or your Bahia grass with that product that is actually labeled for that situation. So typically we're going to see herbicide injury from misuse of a product, um, not calibrating our sprayer, so applying a rate that's too high for that desired forage um, or timing. So once again, referring to that label for all of that information on timing and rate, um, timing to be effective at controlling that weed, as well as timing to not cause damage to that desired forage. So takes really need to focus on that, that label and reading that information. Now most, in most scenarios, herbicide injury is a result of other issues such as low soil fertility, a low soil pH or other nutrient deficiency and in many cases. I will tell you this year in my experience with the cases that I've dealt with in regards to dead spots or um, decline in production or a thinning of a stand or loss of a stand, so far have not been a result of a herbicide injury. So if you are concerned about that, you know, keep notes, keep track. Hopefully you're keeping notes and records of what you're doing and when you're doing it. And um, not only for TDA, but also for situations like this where you can look back at your records and see, okay, well, I haven't sprayed in, you know, 
since last year. So it, it can't be a her it's not likely to be a herbicide injury. So there's something else. There's another issue. Um, so typically herbicide injury is, is kind of the straw that breaks the camel's back um, unless we are using a product inappropriately. So once again, the label is the law to not only be effective at controlling those wheat species, but also to be to be conscious of protecting that desired forage, um, Bermuda grass or Bahia grass. All right, so soil fertility. Um, and um, soil fertility, in my experience, has been one of the biggest issues or the biggest reasons we have seen a decline or a thinning of a stand or lack of production. Um, so most of our fertility decisions, a lot of times, are based on economics, on the cost of fertilizer, Let's see, we have a question. Um, we will, I'll answer, there's a question on graspers. I'll, I'll address that at the, at the end, um, if that's okay. But go ahead and put in your questions and we'll get, it, get to that. All right, so nutrients. Um, soil fertility is, in my experience, has been one of the number one reasons I've seen issues um, in Bermuda grass or Bahia grass stands. Um, even bahia grass can have some fertility issues. Most people think that bahia grass will persist without, without any nutrients whatsoever, and that's not necessarily the case. So first and foremost, whenever it comes to soil fertility, soil testing is, the, is where we need to start. Without a soil analysis, we don't know what nutrients have carried over from previous seasons or previous applications. And we, we can't answer what the true deficiency is or if there is even a deficiency. And I will tell you any time this year, any other time I've had a question about a dead spot or a thinning of a stand, one of my first questions is, when was the last time you took a soil test? Do you have a soil analysis? Did you take one this year? Um, and even if they hadn't taken one that year, I still wanted to see what their most recent soil analysis was. Now, if they hadn't taken one that year, um, say in 2020 when they're seeing the impact, that's my first recommendation is to collect some soil samples, um, to sample the entire field, to sample the dead spot, to sample areas that are in very good production or appear to be in good production, and to do a comparison to see if, you know, there is an imbalance of some sort. So starting with a soil test will answer one, of, you know, it's very easy to answer a question whether it's a nutrient deficiency or not. And in my experience, several of the situations have been from a nutrient deficiency. One was very obviously a potassium deficiency, which in my experience has been one of the biggest reasons we have seen a thinning of a stand is from potassium deficiency. Most of us understand why nitrogen is important. The more nitrogen you pour into that hay meadow or that pasture, you're going to improve your yield, the amount of Bermuda grass you produce, but you're also going to improve the crude protein, the new part of the nutritive value of that plant. And we can see an immediate impact from applying nitrogen. If we have rainfall, that Bermuda grass is gonna start growing, start being productive, and, and we'll think we don't have any other issues and that may not necessarily be the case. So when we look at how much nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium are actually important for Bermuda grass production, um, 50 pounds of nitrogen to produce one ton or 2,000 pounds of Bermuda grass, 14 pounds of phosphorus to produce a ton, and 42 pounds of potassium to produce a ton of Bermuda grass. Like I said, most of us don't ignore nitrogen, but often phosphorus and potassium are ignored as well as some of our secondary nutrients or even some micronutrients. Um, and often in East Texas in our sandy soils, we can have some deficiencies in sulfur, um, and that could potentially impact our, our forage production, our Bermuda grass production. So we understand why nitrogen is important. Phosphorus, why is phosphorus in, is important? Now we don't need very much phosphorus, about 14 pounds to produce a ton. However, phosphorus is important for root growth and development. Phosphorus is going to be very important as our forages are trying to recover from drought. It'll be important that they have adequate phosphorus available in order to regrow that root structure um, to, to continue to regrow top growth as well. So rebuilding that root structure following a drought is critical. Phosphorus will also be very important when we are establishing a new stand, whether it's from sprigs for Tifton 85 or coastal Bermuda grass, or it's from seed. 
Phosphorus is important for root growth and development. So a very important nutrient at the beginning of the growth of that stand to build that root structure and to continue to, to grow forage as well. Potassium is probably, like I said, phosphorus and potassium are most often ignored because we can put phosphorus and potassium out and we may not see an immediate, we're not gonna see Bermuda grass necessarily jump out of the ground like you might with nitrogen and some rainfall. So we tend to think that they're not very important. Potassium is very important. Potassium, I like to say potassium is for persistence. Um, potassium is important for proper water re relations, so water use efficiency. It's important for disease tolerance. It is also important for winter hardiness. Now for a lot of us in Texas, we don't necessarily think that winter hardiness is an issue, but it, it can be, especially as if you are, especially if you're in Northeast Texas. And some of our Bermuda grass varieties are not necessarily very winter hardy. Um, and so potassium is important for maintaining that winter hardiness as well. And when we talk about disease, when we talk about bipolaris leaf spot or other disease issues, they typically are a result of a potassium deficiency. Um, that is why my first recommendation is always to evaluate your soil nutrient status. Do you need to improve your your fertility, your fertility applications and improve the amount of, or increase the amount of phosphorus and potassium that you have in, in that field. So low potassium fertility, I have seen even this year, a couple of the cases were a result from a low, pota low potassium fertility, very deficient. Um, one field had the soil test recommendation was over 200 pounds per acre. So that was of course the first thing that needed to be fixed was the potassium deficiency. And that was on a hay meadow. And unfortunately for us in East Texas with very sandy soils, they are going to be very infertile and they do not hold on to potassium like our heavier clays do. So we tend to already be deficient in potassium very often in East Texas with our very sandy soils. So potassium fertility is, is very important. Um, even if you have a heavy clay soil, a blackland clay, do not assume that you have adequate potassium. It is always best to test, to do a soil analysis, to, to make sure you're not deficient. I mean, it's a lot easier to test and know that you're not than to not test and be deficient and continue to have problems. So starting with that soil test will be critical. So deficiency in potassium is going to be poor stress tolerance. Um, it's going to be more difficult for that Bermuda grass to survive other stressors, whether it's a disease such as bipolaris leaf spot, whether it's a herbicide injury or a herbicide application, or if it's drought. Um, I will tell you a lot of the forages, a lot of the Bermuda grass stands that did not survive the drought of 2011, part of their problem was nutrient deficiencies. Fertilizer, especially potassium, had been very expensive. So people just didn't apply potassium. They didn't see the need. Um, and they ended up paying for it much later. Reduced winter hardiness, decreased disease resistance, as well as diminished rhizome and stolen production. And that, that is important for persistence of Bermuda grass. So how to solve soil test, like I already said, start there. Another recommendation is along with that soil test is to have plant tissue samples analyzed for nutrients. Um, and the recommendation is the top six inches of about three to four week old growth and to have those analyzed for potassium to make sure that those plants are actually using and pulling that potassium from the soil uh, for plant growth and plant persistence. So in regards to a plant analysis, um, in plant tissue, potassium concentration should be above 2.2%. Levels that are less than 1.8 can result in rapid declines in forage persistence and growth and production. Um, so that is a, a good way to determine or to look at potassium utilization and availability to those plants. Soil test potassium should ideally be quote unquote high. <clears throat> if soil test levels are low or even on the low side of medium, potassium deficiency may occur during a drought. And we live in Texas, so we are I feel like we're always on the verge of a drought. Uh, sometimes right now, considering the number of times we're, I'm running my sprinkler system, I kind of feel like I'm, we're in a drought, even per the drought monitor, even though per the drought monitor, we're in fairly good conditions. We would like some more rainfall, but we could be a lot worse. Uh, remember the plant absorbs potassium from the soil by drawing in water. 
So drought stress, drought is going to lead to a decrease in potassium absorption. Um, so unfortunately, those things, potassium deficiency and drought can go hand in hand uh, very easily. So I'm going to pause for a second and see. All right, so we'll get to the Grassberg question towards the end. Um, there's a question about getting a copy of the presentation. I will tell you if you send me an email um, and I'll show you where you can find my contact information. If you send me an email, I'll be happy to email you a copy um, as well. All right, so like I said, potassium is for persistence. Um, this photo is, I think it's, I'm pretty sure it's courtesy of Dr. Vince Havey, who I think has joined us this evening. Um, this is a great illustration of the importance of potassium. So potassium is for persistence. Very easy to remember, P and P. Um, so you can tell just by leaving potassium out on the plot on the right, you see some sorrel, you see some weeds. If you look through the weeds, you will also see some some bare thatch, some brown bare soil. Some thatch basically is, is what it is where the Bermuda grass has just thinned and it's just not very productive. Um, so anytime someone calls me about a reduction in production or a thinning of a stand, my first thought and my first questions are about fertility and are even more specifically about potassium um, deficiencies because that has historically been a very common common reason in East Texas. Soil pH can also influence our production primarily because of nutrient recovery. So soil pH impacts our ability of our plants to utilize or to recover those nutrients. Now this is a very broad table. So this is kind of a broad stroke across forage species. Keep in mind that different forage species are more tolerant of soil acidity or some forage species will tolerate a higher soil pH than others. So it's very important to understand for your forage species as well for the variety that you are growing, um, what is the preferred soil pH or what is the tolerance of that particular forage species and variety to various soil pHs. So this is a broad generalization. So the blue line indicates a soil pH of 5.8. And that is what the soil lab at College Station as well as at SFA consider to be the critical level. So if your pH drops below 5.8, either lab is going to recommend a lime application. Depending on how low that soil pH will impact the lime recommendation, the rate that they recommend. Um, as you see, as you drop, as your soil pH becomes more acidic, or as that pH goes down, that number goes down, it's more difficult for your forages, for our forages to utilize any nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, or potassium that we have applied. So maintaining though an appropriate soil pH for the forage species and the forage variety that you are growing, that you are trying to maintain, is going to be very important. And especially for us in East Texas, our sandy soils tend to be very acidic. So that is a bigger challenge for us. And our heavier blackland clays or soils that have some clay, oftentimes those soil pHs are appropriate. And in some locations, they can actually be too high. Um, but for most of us in East Texas, soil, acidic soils, soils with a low soil pH are our, one of our challenges. And maintaining an appropriate soil pH for that forage species and variety is going to be important for nutrient recovery, persistence, and production of those forage species. All right, drought. Drought, of course, is outside of our control, but we can follow a lot of management practices to create forage, to support forages that are more tolerant of drought. Bermuda grass, by nature, is very drought tolerant. Now, there are some varieties, such as Tipton 85, is actually more drought tolerant than coastal Bermuda grass. Um, but Bermuda grass is more drought tolerant than Bahia grass. Um, if you remember in the drought of 2011, a lot of people thought the drought killed their Bahia grass. And a lot of people celebrated thinking, well, I won't have Bahia grass ever again. The drought killed it. Well, unfortunately, it, it goes dormant. And most of us, if we have any Bahia grass, probably have a good enough seed bank that that Bahia grass is going to come back. Um, but drought tolerance is going to be impacted by our management, our soil fertility, our soil pH, promoting that desired forage when we have good growing conditions will determine whether or not that Bermuda grass or Bahia grass 
tolerates or survives or recovers from drought conditions. So following best management practices during good growing conditions really reduces the overall impact the drought can have on our warm season perennial stands. Um, so paying a, following best management practices, soil fertility, soil pH, and not overgrazing those forages during good conditions can really help those forages survive and persist through and beyond drought conditions. So grazing management. Um, grazing management will have a huge impact on survivability of and persistence of our perennial stands. And I have seen in this, in this season, in 2020, where a combination of a very short side going into winter and too much pressure from winter forages really obliterate, really cause, really make an impact on that warm season perennial sod as it tried to recover in 2020. So in regards to grazing management, we have to think about and have to understand what happens below the soil surface. So not just what, what we see. Of course, if we have a well, a good stand, we're going to have leaf growth, leaf production above the soil surface. And hopefully we'll also have a good root structure below the soil surface. Now, if we, that's how we started this season, if we start grazing or harvesting, in order for that plant to regrow, it has to, it has to produce leaves. As it regrows, that's what it's doing. It's producing new leaves, so then it can photosynthesize and produce its own food. Well, if we've removed a lot of the leaves, it's not gonna be able to photosynthesize as well or as much to produce new leaves. So it starts to pull from the root structure. So as regrowth begins, it pulls from that root structure any carbohydrates, food sources that it needs in order to produce leaves, in order to continue to photosynthesize and produce more food. Now, if we continue to graze, maybe we have our stocking rate is too high. We have too many animals on that pasture at a given time. So we have our grazing pressure is too high. We have too many animals per acre. Um, within that field and they're continuing to graze. Anytime a new leaf pops up, it's grazed down. Unfortunately, if that is the pattern, if that is the situation, those roots are going to continue to die back as we continue to deplete what we see above the soil surface. Obviously, those root structures that are very minimal and very shallow, those plants are not going to survive a drought. They can't take advantage of any moisture that may be deeper in the soil profile or any nutrients that may be deeper in the soil profile. It's limited to only what it can access in that very shallow soil. And those plants are going to be less likely to survive a drought. They're going to be already very stressed. They're going to be more susceptible to disease or herbicide damage. And obviously they're less competitive against any weeds. Obviously, you don't have a lot of competition below the soil surface or above the soil surface. So you've opened up that canopy and you created an opportunity for other seeds to germinate and things like crabgrass or hay grass or broom sedge um, to become more competitive and outcompete that Bermuda grass. So ideally, we want to make sure we are managing our grazing to the point that those forages have an opportunity to recover. Now that may not necessarily mean that you need to break up your 100 acre pastures into five acre you know, paddocks and rotate your animals every 10 minutes. Doesn't necessarily mean that you have to go so far to that extreme. Um, it means you may mean you need to decrease your stocking rate. You may need to reduce the number of animals that have access to that pasture at a given time. Um, and especially if forage production is reduced, you need to have a lighter stocking rate, fewer animals. Um, so there's, there's a whole lot of information that we can talk about in regards to grazing management. Um, but making sure that we are not overgrazing, that we are allowing that Bermuda grass or Bahia grass an opportunity to rest and recover. So not only can it regrow more leaf material, but it can also build and maintain an adequate root structure so that that forage can persist beyond just that season or that, that limited period of time. Um, so it's going to be much more productive with a substantial root structure. So disease. Um, disease is a, another common issue we see with when we start to see a thinning of a stand um, a lot of people go or think that they have a disease. Bob Polaris leaf spot is, is a fungus. Um, so as a fungus, it prefers moisture and humidity. So if we think about 
any other fungus that we may be familiar with, when we have humidity, moisture, and heat, that's when it, it does the best, when it, it can be very prolific. Bob Polaris leaf spot can spread very easy with air wind movement. We can spread um, this fungus with our equipment. Um, but like I mentioned earlier, as far as the disease, it's very similar to the common cold. So we may, with best management practices, we may get Bob Polaris leaf spot because of weather conditions, but it's not likely to cause a big impact on our Bermuda grass or, or even our Bahia grass unless our Bermuda grass is already stressed because we haven't fertilized, haven't maintained soil fertility, especially with potassium. We've overgrazed or there's been drought stress the previous season. Various stressors can, can increase the negative impact that a disease such as Bipolaris leaf spot can have on, on Bermuda grass. So here's a closer picture. You're typically going to see the impact starting with the lower leaves. Um, it may, some of the lower leaves may die. You'll see discoloration or spots on that leaves. Um, they can, it can move up into further up in the structure of that plant. So you may see some damage further up, but it is gonna start with the lower leaves. Unfortunately, there are no fungicides that are labeled for pastures or hay meadows. So the only thing we can do is determine if there are other stressors that have led to this issue with bipolaris leaf spot. So soil testing, do we need to improve our soil fertility to prevent this from happening in the future? And then weather conditions. We have some warmer, drier conditions, a lot of times that will kill the fungus. And then also try not to spread the fungus if we have it in one field and not in another. Um, try to limit the equipment that's going back and forth or clean your equipment before you go into a field that doesn't appear to be contaminated at that point. Um, it can be very damaging, can really reduce, you know, really thin out a stand, reduce production, reduce yield. Another issue that I've seen this year is rust. Rust is going to be somewhat similar to bipolaris leaf spot, have very similar visuals. Um, of our Bermuda grass varieties, Alicia Bermuda grass is more susceptible to rust as opposed to coastal or, or Tipton 85 Bermuda grass. I've only seen one case of rust this year and that was in an Alicia field. Um, following a harvest and some rainfall, it was alleviated, was no longer a problem. Um, this was in a field that is well managed with fertilizer practices. They control their volunteer ryegrass and whatnot. But I think weather was a big impact factor in that regards. Um, so like I said, most of our other varieties are not as susceptible to rust as Alicia Bermuda grass is. So keep that in mind, some varieties are gonna be more sensitive to some of these issues as opposed to others. Um, Bob Polaris, I'm not aware of any of our varieties that are less susceptible to Bob Polaris. Um, so maintaining appropriate management can really reduce the, the bigger impact of bipolaris leaf spot on your pastures or hang meadows. And remember, no matter what, um, if someone tells you that there's a fungicide that you can use, please ask your county agent or ask me before you ever buy or use a product. Or better yet, um, as well, you can look up on cdms.net or greenbook.net, look up that product by the trade name or if they tell you the active ingredient, make sure it is labeled for pasture and hay meadows before you ever purchase a product. As far as I know, at this point, there are no fungicides labeled for hay production or a pasture for Bermuda grass. There are fungicides that are labeled for Bermuda grass in a yard, in a turf situation, maybe for a golf course or your home lawn, but they're not labeled for pasture or hay. So please ask questions before you you spray something like that um, unknowingly on, on your pasture or hay meadow. We do not want to cause further damage, especially if something that's already potentially diseased or has some other underlying stress issues. Soil compaction, like I mentioned, soil compaction is typically not as much of an issue in our sandy soils as it may be in, as it can be in some of our heavier, heavier clay soils. Um, so depending on your soil type, as well as historic use of that property may impact whether or not you have a risk of soil compaction. So most of our, typically we see soil compaction in fields that are heavily trafficked. So cropping systems where they are plant, they are tilling, 
they are, you know, running a lot of heavy equipment for planting and then harvesting and maybe spraying fungicides or herbicides and then, you know, harvesting and then tilling again and then replanting. So they're constantly, heavy equipment's constantly going over that ground. Excuse me. And that can lead to soil compaction. And soil compaction can prevent the penetration of those root structures deeper into the soil profile to access moisture and nutrients. So it can limit nutrient recovery and moisture um, utilization that can obviously limit forage production and forage persistence. There have been a few situations this season where I have recommended that the producers evaluate or determine whether or not they have soil compaction as a potential issue based on their soil type and based on eliminating other potential issues. Um, knowing that their soil fertility was appropriate, that they had been following soil test recommendations, they weren't necessarily deficient in any nutrients, um, they had been, you know, appropriately using herbicides, et cetera, that maybe it was a hay meadow and, and whatnot. So soil compaction could potentially be a concern, once again, depending on your soil type and management in previous years. Um, one of the best ways to check for soil compaction is a fancy piece of equipment that's very expensive. Um, a pentometer is very effective at evaluating or testing for, for soil compaction, but I don't even have one of those. Um, I just haven't had much of a use for, um, for myself in, in East Texas. But one of the easiest ways is to take a piece of rebar um, along the fence lines, typically where we do not have a lot of traffic. Um, see how far you can get that rebar into the soil along a fence line where you don't have either a lot of animal traffic or equipment traffic. And then compare that to the middle of the field where you would have more traffic um, to determine if, if you do have soil compaction. Um, soil compaction is typically needs to be alleviated with uh, machinery, with heavy equipment. Unfortunately, to be effective at relieving or alleviating alleviating soil compaction um, can really upturn a lot of soil and cause a lot of damage to your side. So it may ultimately result in needing to, to replant potentially. So it will really depend on what you use to alleviate that soil compaction. Do know that something such as an airway or an air or a um, aerator, anything that has spikes or spikes or um, short pegs or, or some kind of roller with with spikes on it that do not go, that are very shallow, maybe an inch to two inches, that is not going to alleviate soil compaction. Soil compaction is typically much deeper, uh, further into the soil profile and re would require a shank that could actually go under that compaction and break it up um, and hopefully cause minimal damage to, the, to overturning all of that soil. Um, so an airway, um, an aerator of any kind is not going to be effective and could potentially increase soil compaction if not used, um, if used to try to alleviate soil compaction. So an aerator is something that I don't know, that I don't typically recommend unless we're using it to try to increase seed to soil contact but with while we're overseeding cool season forages into a perennial side. Um, so just know that it's typically going to take something a lot stouter that's going to go deeper and um, that can, it can be a very slow process and can be very difficult to pull those shanks under that soil to alleviate soil compaction. Um, but that could, that will, soil compaction will impact our forage production and persistence. So that could potentially be a problem. But for most of us, I would say that's kind of at the bottom of the list. We would need to answer some of the previous and evaluate some of the pre previous discussed issues. Um, that could ultimately be the cause of our Bermuda grass decline or thinning of a stand. Last but not least, insect pest can be damaging and I have actually seen some of these pests take out a good stand of, of forage, of warm season perennial forages. The ones that we're most familiar with, armyworms, fall armyworms, um, grasshoppers, can be very damaging if left out of control, if not controlled. Um, in years where we've had very large armyworm populations, many people have seen fall armyworms take out an entire field. However, if that field has been managed appropriately previously with adequate nutrients, um, weed control, not overgrazed, that forage will recover. Um, I should have included, I have an excellent photograph a producer took of a field that was demolished 
by some fall armyworms. Two weeks later, you couldn't tell an armyworm had been on that property at all. That Bermuda grass came back, it grew back. It had adequate nutrients in order to do so. However, if we've been deficient on nutrients or overgrazed that forage, that it may not recover as quickly or as well as a better managed forage system. Bermuda grass stem maggot, it does only kill the top two to three leaves, but if it is left untreated, it is gonna to continue to reinfest within those fields and can really reduce, it's definitely gonna reduce your production, the yield, and it could, could, if left untreated for multiple years, really reduce your stand of Bermuda grass. Now, some other insect pests that um, I've come across in, in my time here in Texas and that have been, an issue, have been issues in some fields would be the Southern Mole Cricket or the Tawny, tawny Mole Cricket, as well as grubs. So at the, the top picture you'll see is the grubs. Grubs, they're white. They're either, they could either be the May or June or the June, the green June beetle. Um, and those beetles, the beetles themselves are not necessarily damaging, but the grubs can be damaging to our forages. Those grubs will feed during the summer and the fall, and they actually feed on the roots of our forages or vegetation or plants that can ultimately kill those plants and that can lead to a thinning of a stand. Now, where we typically see more grubs is in our sandy soils. They do like our sandy soils in East Texas, but they also like organic matter. So if you have hay bales that are just sitting out in a field or in a location, maybe where you've been feeding hay um, and it's just rotted away or it's just, you know, accumulated and starting to rot and creating organic matter basically, a lot of times you'll see a lot of high grubs or a lot of grubs in those locations. If you're using a lot of poultry litter, um, any type of manure that is going to increase the organic matter within that field can, can make a, create a desirable location for those grubs. Uh, like I said, they feed on the roots. Um, the beetles deposit their eggs in the sandy soil and then there, there in lies we end up with the grubs. There are no insecticides labeled for grubs, but I will tell you that those grubs uh, will actually surface at night. They'll come out of the soil at night. And if you put out some carbaryl or seven, um, you, could, uh, you could actually control some of those grubs, but they only come out at night. So you have a, you have a window of opportunity if that is, is in fact your, your issue. Another one is the Southern Mole Cricket. I've actually seen a couple of years ago a decimation of a bahia grass stand from the southern mole cricket. And it is a problem in bahia grass. Um, I have not seen it to be an issue in Bermuda grass, but I'm sure it could be. So we can't discount it um, completely. So the mole cricket deposits, the females deposit their eggs in the soil in April and May, and then they hatch um, during the summer and those nymphs develop over the summer. Now, typically we're not going to see damage caused by the mole crickets until late summer, early fall. As those nymphs become adults, they're gonna cause much more damage. Now they don't eat the forage. What they do is they tunnel in the soil because they're eating other insects such as earthworms and whatnot that are in the soil. And when they tunnel, they create air pockets and space and that can become an issue that can dry out those root structures and ultimately lead to death of those roots and then could really lead to death of a, of a plant stand. Um, and I have actually seen that in bahia grass. Um, it started out, the damage started out in small patches, small dead spots, and then it just started growing um, in those fields and, and caused quite a bit of damage. And what we did was we looked at their soil fertility, their soil pH was appropriate, their fertility was appropriate, I couldn't see any evidence of disease, but what I did was I sent off plant samples from the edges of those dead spots. Um, I sent off live leaf material as well as roots. I sent those off to plant pathology and they determined that it was more likely the mole cricket was causing damage to those root structures because in those dead spots, there was no live root material and other plants were coming back. Other species were coming back to life, but there were no roots on any of the dead bahia grass plants that appeared to still be within those dead spots. So that tunneling is what takes out, um, ends up killing, drying out those root structures and killing those plants. Unfortunately, there's no insecticides labeled for mole cricket control in Bermuda grass or bahia grass. And they would be really hard to control because they are in the soil surface. They're, I mean, they're in the soil, so they're not exposed 
at any point where they could be impacted by pesticides. Um, so unfortunately, we don't have a lot we can do with that. Hopefully catch them very quickly um, and, then, and then hope we can recover. We may have to replant in some parts of our field. But in my 12 years, I've only seen one case of that and that was in a Bahia grass stand in, in Henderson. Um, so just something else. Unfortunately, you're probably thinking, you know, how many things do I have to think about? Do I have to deal with? Do I have to be worried about? Well, this is agriculture. So we have a lot of things to think about and, and to be concerned about. But if we can follow some best management practices to promote that desired forage, we'll have less to be concerned about, um, less likely to have disease issues, less likely to have major failures or major impact on our stands because of drought or because of, of a herbicide, potential herbicide injury. So following best management practices is going to be key to having a persistent stand. Um, there's a lot of things we can't control, but there are a lot of things that we can by maintaining soil fertility, paying attention to our soil pH, controlling any weeds that become problematic or start to become problematic. Um, Painted, looking for, you know, if we have right weather conditions, we may have some disease issues, but if we're maintaining our soil fertility, they're not gonna be overly damaging. Um, not overgrazing our pastures, allowing those forages to rest and recover, regrow that root structure in order to produce um, top growth, forage growth as well. Control any insect pests that we can. We can control fall armyworms. We can control grasshoppers and we can control, we can try to control Bermuda grass stem maggot. Um, the others, the grubs and, and the mole crickets are probably rare, not very common, but just something to be aware of that could be another issue um, or could be, could be impacting. So as far as the grubs, get those hay bales out of the, you know, store them in a barn. Don't leave them in one location to rot. If you're feeding hay, move it around your field to spread out that organic matter, um, to spread out that manure. Um, if you're using poultry litter, it's great, great source, alternative source for nutrients and a great way to add some organic matter to your soil. But if you start to see some, some thinning of stands or some dead spots, it, it could potentially be some grubs. Um, so best management practices, following those best management practices is gonna be the most effective way to prevent a decline or a thinning of our Bermuda grass or Bahia grass stands. Um, so <clears throat> just follow those best management practices to the best of your ability. Now, if you're looking for more info, forgefacts.tamu.edu. Um, there are publications, events, um, other useful links that are available. If you subscribe to this website, every Friday you will receive a short newsletter um, from me. They're, I try to keep them fairly short and fairly timely. So if I get phone calls or a lot of questions about a specific issues, if agents and producers are letting know, me know that they're starting to see army worms, that's the, one of the first things I'm going to push through through Forage Facts to let everybody else that subscribed know now's the time to be paying attention, to be looking for army worms, to have your insecticides lined up and to be prepared to control if they become a problem on your property. So <clears throat> With that, I'll be happy to answer any questions.